this morning, I've got this message has been on my heart for a few weeks, and and this was my oppor- this is my opportunity to release it. So uh, I'm excited uh, to just to share this message with you. Just some revelation that God has been showing me uh, over the past few weeks, and so we're going to dig in. Uh, and the message is, or the title is Choosing Blessings. And I want to, I'm going to just kind of give you the quick outline. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about this idea that uh, God doesn't have favorites. He doesn't have, uh, he's not like, hey, I really like that guy and that girl over there, but uh, these other people, yeah, they're all right. There's an unconditional love that he has for every person. And we've been talking about this idea of, of love, the Father's love, and we've been talking about the trust that we have, that we are to put our trust in the Lord. It's that uh, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him or know him, and he will make your path straight. It says, another translation is he will cut your path. He'll cut the path for you. He'll, he'll be the one that actually leads you down the path. And so, uh, the idea, though, is that he doesn't have favorites, but he does have intimates. And we see this throughout Scripture. We see that there are those that he calls his friend. He calls Moses his friend. He calls, Abra- he calls Abraham his friend. Uh, he calls the disciples his friends. And, and there's, there's these intimates that the Father has. And where does that come from? Is it that God selected him and said, oh, you're going to be my intimate and you're going to be one that's really close to me? No, what it comes from is it's actually out of our trust in the Lord. Those become the intimates of the Lord. And so we all have the opportunity to become intimates of the Father. So I'm going to talk about that. I also want to talk about uh, how God actually, or why God actually releases blessings at times and why he withholds blessings at times. And he does. He does not always release the blessings. There are promises that we have, but the blessing of the promise is not always released, and there's a reason for that. And then lastly, that as we have this faith, and this all comes down to faith, the trust is faith, that that out of that, there is an action that's actually required on our part. And so this is what we're going to hit on. So here we go. Uh, I want to start by just explaining quickly this idea of trust, versus faith, and uh, faith is really, it's, it's complete trust, or it's, a, it's this confidence, in, in, in our case, in the Lord. As we say, we're trusting in the Lord. It's that confidence, complete confidence, or complete trust in the Lord. There are actually seven Hebrew words for trust that you'll see throughout the Old Testament. Uh, but then as you get into the New Testament, as they, the translators came and, and started translating uh, the Old Testament in Greek, what they did is they combined it into one word. And so the word that we have in the New Testament, faith, with is pistos, is, is a combination of the seven uh, Hebrew words for, for trust. And so the whole point in this is that when we're talking about trust or we're talking about faith, we're really talking about the same thing. I would say the difference is, is in the New Testament, as we have this faith, Faith, actually, now we have the Holy Spirit, which allows us to have even a greater faith because we have the Holy Spirit that rises up on the inside of us. There's a power that now we have uh, that's greater than, than what those of the Old Testament had. Uh, they were the ones that longed for this. And so it, it just a kind of a fact here that you can look at. Uh, you can go back and confirm it for yourself. The, the word faith is used 250 times throughout the Bible. And I I use the uh, NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible, which is the most literal version of the translations, of the major translations. So if you use that, 250 times faith is used, 246 of them are in the New Testament. So all that to say that word faith is really a New Testament term for trust in the Old Testament, okay? Got it? That took a long time to say just a little... (laughs) Faith equals trust. I could have said that. We could have said five minutes. <laughs> oh, well, here we go. So I want to I dig into this idea that the blessings of the Lord are actually dependent upon our trust or our faith in the Lord. The Lord is actually looking for those who trust him, who have faith in him. 
In 2 Chronicles 17.9, you can throw these scriptures up as I go. I'm just going to move quickly through these. It says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen, and this is that blessing, strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So what's he doing? He's looking throughout. He wants to know whose hearts are fully committed to him. Who are the ones that are going to trust and have that faith in God? And those are the ones that he's strengthening. Uh, and you see that it, it is a heart issue. He's actually looking at the heart. It's not, it's not just the mind. It's not just the intellect to say, oh, yeah, I trust in God. It's actually a heart issue. It's the same thing as I was talking about in Proverbs. Is trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's right. So now let me just say, so here's the second part. In Hebrews uh, 11.6, it says, faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So faith is required to come to, to have the pleasure of God. There's a, there's a correlation there that we have to understand. It goes on to say, uh, because anyone who comes to him must believe that, first, that he exists, and then secondly, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And there it is again. That's that. There's that blessing, there's that reward that comes to those who earnestly seek him. Okay. Okay. So, quick example, I've got three kids. If you were here last week, you got to see them. They gave the announcements. Uh, Great kids. I love my kids. Uh, I have to say that sometimes. Uh, But I actually love my kids. I I would say I have an unconditional love, except I don't think it's quite the same as the Lord's unconditional love for us. Uh, But but the idea is, is that I love them all the same. Now, the thing is, is when they're obedient, when they're... uh, when they're just like sweet and they come before you, when they're loving, when they have that thankful attitude, that's when I want to be with them. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, this is my intimate. (laughs) This is the one who's sweet. Now, but when they're acting up, when they're throwing a fit, when they're being disobedient, I don't really want to be with them. I still love them, but I don't want to be with them. You guys get it? All you parents say amen. (laughs) Amen. You want to give them away at that point. Like, there's got to be a better one. Like, this has a defect. (laughs) I didn't say that. (laughs) Don't tell my kids. I love my kids. Uh, So here's the thing. I I believe that it's it's similar with God, that that God has an unconditional love for us, uh, that we're his children, that we're loved by him, we're sons and daughters of God. But his blessings actually come as a condition of our trust in him. Let me say it this way. The level of our trust or our faith in God determines the level of our blessings that we receive from the Lord. I know some of you are going, what? Let me say it again. Okay. (laughs) The level of our trust or our faith in God is it's a determining factor, or it's a a major determining factor of the level of blessing that actually we receive from the Lord. This is so important that we understand this. Because a lot of times we go, well, God loves us. He loves us unconditionally. Yes, he absolutely loves us unconditionally. And there are promises that we have. We have promises in the Lord. But the release of the blessing of those promises actually comes through our trust in the Lord. I know I don't have you all yet, but bear with me. Follow along. James, I want to talk, first of all, this, this James 1.3 says this. It says that in the testing of our faith, so it's a trust in the Lord. Actually, can you put up, there's a diagram I have. Can you put that, that diagram up as I talk about this? There is a, there's the promises of God. You call this the faith cycle or the blessing cycle. I just kind of put this together to just give us a better understanding of this. But uh, we, we have this trust in the Lord. But then there is a testing of our hearts. And the Lord actually tests our hearts. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not a big fan of tests. I've taken a lot of tests in my life. And every time there's that anxiety that rises up, you're like, oh, I got another test I have to take. Well, guess what? Uh, this is, these are like the tests, and, and God doesn't really tell you, hey, guess what? You're going to be taking a test next week. Get ready. These are like the pop quizzes that come in. You're like, ah, 
I wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> I wish you would have told me. <laughs> but this is, what, this is what the Lord will do, is he will actually test our hearts. And then there's this faith in action, which I'll talk about. And then out of that, we have an opportunity to make a good choice or a bad choice. There's these choices that we make. Uh, God will release the blessings. Uh, I'm getting way ahead of myself here because I'm going to talk about this. Lay down the bless- we lay down the blessings again, even after we receive them. And then we go back into this place of trusting in the Lord. All right, you can take that down because I'll, I'll talk about it again later. So in James 1.3 where it says, the testing of your faith is what develops the perseverance and the perseverance must finish its work. So there is a testing that is happening and this is how we become mature so that we will not lack anything. And it's how we're able to receive the blessings. So I want to clarify something because a lot of times... Uh, Testing is different than tempting. James talks about this. There's no time that the Lord will tempt his children. Just like I would never tempt my children with evil. But I will test them. I, I will test their hearts to see are they ready. And it's, it's almost like a maturity. It's, it's like this. If I, have, if I have a set of keys to my car, I'm not going to just hand them over to the kids and say, hey, I just want to bless you guys. Go have fun. That's a bad idea, right? Why? Because <laughs> they're not mature in that. They don't have an understanding of that, and they're not, they're not ready for that. It's the same thing with the Lord. There is a testing of our hearts to see what we are ready to receive as far as the blessings, that we would be mature, that we would not lack anything. It's a process that we're going through. In 1 Thessalonians 2.4, Paul says this, and I'm, I know I'm ripping through scriptures here. Just write them down, go through them later. Um, go through them, though. I would encourage you, don't just take the message and walk out and say, okay, we'll be ready for the next one. This is stuff that I feel like the Lord is, he's actually leading us through, and it's like a step-by-step process of where he wants to take us. And we need to, if we miss some of this stuff and we just jump forward, uh, we're going to have to come back around the mountain again and do it again. Let's not do that, Right? And I'm with you guys in this. Let me just say, as I'm speaking these things to you, I'm learning these things. I feel like, like God's downloading these things, and I'm like, ah, oh, I get it, I get it. And he's like, okay, now you need to explain it. And so I have to get this down in my heart to be able to release this to you guys. But we're in this together. We're on this journey of becoming more and more like him, right? Good. Okay. <laughs> so this, where Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2.4, we speak as men approved. There's that approval uh, by God. So we're approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. That's the keys. Here's the keys. You can go, go drive the car because I entrust you because you're approved to do this. goes on to say we are not trying to please men, but we're trying to please God. And how do we please God? Faith. Without faith, you can't please God, right? So we're, so we're trying to please God who tests our heart. So he is testing our heart in these times. He's testing where we are. It's an ongoing process. Uh, Look at the Israelites. We talked about the Israelites a little bit last week. Moses was selected as the guy to to take them out of Egypt. And uh, so they go out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. And what happens? The Lord shows up in mighty ways. First, he opens the Red Sea. Then, he, you know, he's got the, the fire, the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. And he's got the man of bread. All these manifestations of the, of the glory of the Lord. And he's, he's ahead of them. He's walking ahead of them, taking, taking them through this journey. Yet, in the midst of that, they stay in this place of unbelief. They can't come out of this place of unbelief of where they will actually trust in the Lord. And so even though they see the miracles of God, even though they see everything that the Lord is doing, they choose to not go after the Lord and to not trust him. What they do is they say, Moses, no, you do it. You trust God, we'll trust you. What happens when you put your trust in man? Yeah, it's, it's not a good situation. We want to have our trust in the Lord. And so you see all the Israelites, there are 603,550 Israelite men that are coming out of Egypt. Talks about this in, uh, in Romans, I'm sorry, not in Romans, in uh, uh, Numbers, Numbers 1. The actual exact number of, of men. 
Uh, and then if you count women and children, I mean, you're up in the, probably the two millions, uh, especially with families back then. Um, it's like one of the, <laughs> the Myers families. <laughs> you got seven kids. Like, man, it's, it's the big families back then. Uh, so, so here you have all of these people coming out of, out, of, out of Egypt, and they do not trust in the Lord. Uh, but they're given the promise, right? God says, here's the promise. I'm going to take you. You will have the promised land. But then he does not release the promise to them. He does not release the blessing of the promise. Why? Because their hearts are not prepared. And here's the thing. It's actually out of the love of the Father that he doesn't do this. And so what he does is he withholds the blessing. Why does he withhold the blessing? Because if he were to give them that blessing when they weren't trustworthy, what would happen? The entire nation would have been destroyed. So out of his love for this nation, for these people, he withholds the blessing. And he says, you're not ready for it. And I'm going to wait for the next generation who's ready for it. In Deuteronomy 1, Moses says, in spite of all this, in spite of what you've seen God do, the Red Sea, the cloud, the fire, the manna, you did not trust the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey. The Lord swears that not a man of this generation will see the good land that I swore to give your forefathers. It's a strong statement. Then he goes on to say, except Caleb, who actually does trust in the Lord, and Joshua, uh, who will lead the Israelites into the promised land. So there's two men out of the 603, 550, or 603,550 men. There's two of them that actually get to go into the promised land. That's some crazy odds. I, I wouldn't. <laughs> but those are the two of the 12 spies that went in to spy on the land, and they came back and said, yes, we can go. And the others are like, there is no way. We've got giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers. Ain't going to happen. And they're like, no, no, no. We need to trust in the Lord. And so because of their trust in the Lord, they were the two that actually got to experience the promised land. In Hebrews 3.9, I'm going to read out of the Passion Version. It says, there your fathers tested me and tried my patience. Even though they saw my miracles for 40 years, they still doubted me. In 3.17, just a few verses down, it says, they grieved God for 40 years by sinning in their unbelief until they dropped dead in the desert. And let's not be the ones to drop dead in the desert. <laughs> right? That should have been the title. Don't drop dead in the desert. <laughs> How do we not drop dead in the desert? Uh, they didn't receive the inheritance because their hearts were filled with unbelief. We have to get our heart in a position where it is filled with trust in the Lord. And this is what we're going to talk about. But uh, here, so here's the lesson for us. If you go to Hebrews 3.12, it says, So search your heart every day, my brothers and sisters, and make sure that none of you has evil or unbelief hiding within you. This is what we need to do. It says, for it will lead you astray and make you unresponsive to the living God. That's a strong statement. It will make you unresponsive to the living God. So it's one of those things. It's like it's what David says is search my heart. Like know who I am. And, and if, if there's anything unclean, is there anything in me that is not of you? It's one of those things that we have to do constantly. There are always things in our heart that are not so good, right? There's things that pop up all the time. It's usually under times of stress, uh, you know, where, you know, you're doing just fine, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, you hammer your finger, and boy, there's a word that pops out that you didn't even know that was in there, right? <laughs> like, oh, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> where did that come from? There are things in our heart. Uh, it says... Uh, what is it? How does it go? The overflow, out of an overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? A lot of times the things that we say, I catch things all the time. I'll be, I'll be talking or I'll be saying something to my wife or I'll, I'll yell at my kids or something and I'm like, oh, there's a problem with my heart right there. And, and my hope is that I kind of step back in that moment and say, okay, I need to evaluate that and see what the problem is. If I, if I get upset at my wife and say something that I shouldn't say to her, 
it's, it's a time for me to quickly reflect and go, Lord, help me with my heart. Show me where it is. Show me those hidden things in my heart that I would draw close to you, that I would not be unresponsive to the living God. Okay. <laughs> here we go. Uh, side note here. When we receive the blessings, and there are times where, uh, where we receive amazing blessings in our life, here's the thing, is we have to realize that is, it is not these blessings that satisfy us. A lot of times we're like, oh, if I only had this, if I only, if I had this money or if I had this position, if I had this job, if I had this home, life would be good. We have to be so careful because God wants to bless us. But if those blessings come, that we never take those blessings and they become our idols and we hold on to them. Right? You guys agree? 1 Timothy 6, 7 says, we brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. Like, it is about our daily bread. It's not about having too much and it's not about having too little. Proverbs 38 and 9, this is a great scripture. Uh, we we're going through this as, as a, just in our sermon prep and somebody had this verse and I was like, oh, this is so good. It says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. This is to the Lord. Give me neither poverty or riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. This is give us today our daily bread. It says, for if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and thus insult the, uh, God's holy name. So it's this place of saying, Lord, you are the only one that can satisfy it has nothing to do with the blessings. It can, I can be, have little or I can have much. And if it begins to matter in our lives, whether we have little or we have much, then there's something that we need to check in our hearts. Luke 10, or I'm sorry, Luke 16, 10 through 11 says this. Jesus is saying this. It's Jesus' words who says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. A lot of times in the church or just I hear people saying it all the time, oh, if I had, if I had more, I could do this. You know, I could, I could, I could, I don't know, I could give to this. I could tithe to this. I could, I could help in this area. If I had this, I could do this. What Jesus is saying here is, is take what you have and begin to operate in what he's called you to operate in. Begin to use what you have to do it. Put your trust in the Lord with the things that you have and say, Lord, I'm going to do it now, and I believe you're going to begin to see greater blessings out of that. Don't wait until you receive the blessing to be able to do what you want, what you feel like the Lord is calling you to do. Do it in the moment, trusting in him. It goes on to say, uh, and whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much, and so uh, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches or heavenly riches or the eternal riches of the spiritual world. I want to I take you to an example now. So I kind of gave you the example of the Israelites, but let me show you this. This is the, probably the coolest part right here. If, this is Abraham. Uh, if you want to follow along, it's in uh, Genesis 22, and I'm reading from the NLT. The NLT is, from a story standpoint, is a great translation for stories. Just to set this up, God has already promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations and he's promised him a son. This is at the age of 75. It's 25 years go by and he finally gets the promise of his son, Isaac. And now Isaac is going to be the one that actually allows him to be the father of many nations. He's the seed. He's the one that is going to, um, to bring the next, the next blessing, Right? You guys know this story? I'm not going to go into it too much. But so here's, here's the thing is now Isaac is growing up, and this is where we're going to pick it up, is it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied. Here am I. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, the one whom you love so much. So he's clarifying, this is who you're going to take. Uh, it says, and go to the land of Moriah 
Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains in which I will show you. Now, there's not a lot of like emotion in this, but, but I can tell you that in this moment, there had to be a lot of emotion in Abraham. But what does he do? He doesn't, it, we've talked about it, that delayed obedience is actually disobedience. What does he do? He says, the next morning, Abraham, he gets up early, saddles the donkey, and begins the journey. He doesn't wait. He doesn't question God. He doesn't say, well, let me, let's talk about this more. Let me see if this is really something that, that, uh, that I'm supposed to do. No, he says, I'm going into it. I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do. So he goes, and this is what he does. It says, now, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit. So he takes Isaac up to the altar. He puts him on the altar. And then it says, and Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham says, yes, here am I. Do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in this way, for I now know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. This was a test. This was a test for Abraham. Why was it a test? It was a test to see if he was truly going to be the father of many nations. There was a promise in his life, but it was this moment that was going to determine whether actually he was going to receive the blessing of the promise that he had. Goes on to say this, the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven and said this, this is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars of the sky and like the sands of the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. Trust, the action step of trust is obedience. There's an action that comes out of that. And so because he was trustworthy in that, he actually received the blessing. Now, here's the thing. In our lives, there are many times where we receive blessings from the Lord, and then what do we do? We are like this, like, oh, oh, this is a good thing. The Lord gave it to me. I'm holding on to it. I'm not letting it go. This, I see it. It happens in ministry. It happens in businesses. It happens with job promotions. It happens, happens in all areas. The problem is, is that when we do this, we actually take our eyes off the Lord, we take our trust off the Lord, and we now put them on the blessings that we received. If Abraham would have done that and said, no, 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 Lord, you don't understand, Isaac is my blessing so that I can actually be the father of many nations. He would have missed out on being the father of many nations. And, I, and this is, I want us to get this, that, that we have to lay down even the greatest blessings in our life. We have to be willing to lay them down. Everything that we have, we have to be willing to lay it down for the greater blessing. And here's the thing. It's not like, oh, I'm going to lay it down and then, man, it's going to be rough after that. No, there's the Lord. He's our creator. He's our father. He has the very best intentions for us, the very best in mind. But he requires obedience and he requires trust in him. He requires that faith. And when we do that, there is great blessing. Abraham was selected because of his faith. It was because of his faith that it was accredited to him as righteousness, the righteousness of God. We all are son, sons and daughters of Abraham. He's the father of righteousness, of, of grace. Now, I'm not going to get into that. I probably shouldn't have even, that's a whole other uh, topic that I'll get into. But, um, <laughs> but I think this is what we have to understand is that we have to be able to lay down our sacrifices. In, in Hebrews eleven seventeen, 17, it says this, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promise was about to sacrifice his one and only son, the promise. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And this is what Abraham reasoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. Wow. This wasn't a time where, where we had seen, at least not in Scripture, where, where anyone had been raised from the dead. But 
he understood a greater reality than the reality on this earth, that the nature of God, if God is calling him to do it, then he's going to raise the dead. This is the level of trust that he is calling us to. And I know it's a process. We're not there yet. Uh, at least I'm not there yet. Maybe you guys are. But this is what we have to go after. Last thing I want to hit on uh, is, is this idea of that there's an action required with faith. In James 1, 21, it says this, Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith, so you have the faith, and his actions work together. And it's his actions that made his faith complete. So when we talk about faith, there is an action step that's required in order to make our faith complete. Uh, there are choices that we make that every day that decide the direction of our life. It is not by chance that the things that are happening to you are happening to you. There are choices that we make day in and day out. We talked about this last week, Romans 6, 6 in the Passion Version. It says, don't you realize that grace frees you to choose your own master? Again, we talked with grace. Grace is not the liberty to walk in sin. It's the power to overcome sin. When, when we make a choice, we are choosing one or the other. We're either choosing to trust in God or we're choosing on belief. There's no not choosing. You will choose whether you think you're choosing or not. You're either choosing to stay out of it because of unbelief or you're choosing to walk into it. And unbelief is sin. You're choosing that master. Now, thank God for grace as we do this and we're not all, like, we're not all there. I'm not there. But every time that I have that unbelief, thank God that I have that grace to overcome that, that I, that I now say, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna walk in that. I'm gonna choose this. I'm gonna choose life. It says, but choose carefully, for you surrender yourself to become a servant, bound to the one you choose to obey. If you choose to love sin, it will become your master. It will own you and reward you with death. If you choose to love and obey God, this is that trust and that faith in him, he will lead you into perfect righteousness. This is where the blessings come in blessings of the promises. Again, we have the promises, but are we going to say yes to the promises? There's all these promises that God says yes to, and then it says, but to which we say amen in Christ to the glory of God. And in that, it's not just a saying amen, it's an actual response of our heart to say, yes, I trust, with, I trust you in this. I will walk in with you in this, we'll go through this together and you're gonna be the one to give me the blessings in this and then I will not respond to the blessings other than I will, I will keep my focus on you because you're the only one that satisfies. Amen? Oh. <laughs> Lord. Let me just say this. There's, there's a, an opportunity for us to actually condition our responses. What we, what we tend to do sometimes is we wait for a, something to come at us before we try to figure out the response that we're going to have. I would encourage you to actually condition your responses to where the choices that we make, we have already made actually before the situation comes at hand. Christy, is a, she's a tennis player. She was Division I, and we were talking about this the other day, that when she would set up, when she's playing tennis uh, and receiving a serve, when the ball was coming to the right hand, she already knew, if the ball comes here, I'm going to hit it down the line. If the ball comes to the backhand, I'm going to hit it cross court. She knew her response before the ball was served. And this is the way, if we're going to be professional athletes, if we're going to actually play in the game here and do this well, we need to have a response to the things that come at us before they actually come at us. 
Because when they come at us, and if we don't know, if we don't have that response, we're going to be, ah, I don't know what to do in this. Quick example, I was just the other day, I was on the internet, it was about midnight, I was working on a presentation with the county uh, on some things that we're doing, and uh, I'm on a county website, and I'm looking at these pictures and trying to organize things for this presentation, and, and there's this, there's this, they're like, there was all these pictures. It was like, like 100 pictures on the screen. And down at the bottom, there was these two little pictures of it. what it looked like is like a woman in lingerie. And, and it, I know this. I'm not the only one. that, Like, your mind goes, oh, like, what, well, what is that? Like, maybe, I, like, that's weird. It's on a county website. Like, what, you know? And, and part of me is like, oh, I just want to click on it to check it out. Now, <laughs> But there is, a, there is a response that we have to have. And it took me a second. It wasn't like I went, well, let me pray about it. But, but, what, like, but after about two seconds of like this, oh, in my mind, like immediately I just went to the top and just clicked and just closed the whole thing. And it was just this, ah, get out. We have to flee from those evil desires. We have to flee from those things and walk away from those things. And our response has to be set before we step into those things. And we think, oh, those are little things. It's not a big deal. It's like what I talked about last week with the, uh, you know, Victoria's Secret and things like that. We have to preset in our mind how we're going to respond to these things. And those little things, those little choices actually eventually result in some big choices that impact our life in a negative way and bring death and I want to encourage you, even in the little things, and when we, when we lose the battle, you can still, this is, it's called repent. Repent means turn, go the other direction, and flee from it. Get out of it, and we have that authority now, by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to overcome these things. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Billy Graham, he's, he's done the same thing. He set a standard that he would, he would not travel uh, he would not meet, he would not eat alone with any other woman than his wife. Uh, he set that early on in his life. Uh, Vice President Mike Pence actually took some of that and has followed in that same way and said, look, I am not going to have dinner with another woman and I'm not going to consume alcohol if my, if my wife is not by my side. These are things you go, well, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal. It's a bigger deal than you think. And setting those things as standards in our lives actually predetermines and, and keeps us from coming into the bigger battles that we might have to face. All right, I could go on. I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> Moses says this. This is his final farewell. He says, This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death. Blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. When we choose life, it comes out of this living, loving the Lord, comes out of listening to him, and it comes out of obedience to him. It's that trust. Apostle Paul said this. This is his farewell says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. It isn't how we start the race, but it is how we finish it. Can you guys stand? My prayer for all of us today, because I love you guys so much, and man, I, wanna, I want us to to walk in this greater understanding of who our Father is and who we are called to be. Let's just bow our heads. Lord, I just, we just come before you right now. Lord, and we, we choose life. Lord, we choose to be faithful to you. We, cho we choose to love, listen, and to obey you with everything that we have. Lord, I thank you that in this, there will be great blessings that we will receive in our lives. But in those great blessings, Lord, that we would lay down the Isaacs. We would lay down even the Isaacs when you call us to. Because, Lord, it's only you that satisfies. You're the only one that can satisfy our needs. It's not any blessing in our life. It's not anything else. It's you. So, Lord, I pray for this revelation to be released this morning. Lord, I pray that if, if there's someone in here right now that has not made the choice to accept you as their Lord and Savior. 
Lord, I pray that today would be the day. There's a decision and a choice that's going to be made either way today. Lord, may that decision and may that choice be that they would, they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, for those that are, that are walking in unbelief right now, that are not walking in, that, in, the, in your ways, Lord, I pray that we would, we would turn from those things and we would begin to walk in your ways right now. Lord, that if there's a calling on our life, if there's things in our life right now that, that, that you've called us into and that we've said, well, no, I, I'm not ready for it yet. Father, I pray that today would be the day that we would choose to go after you. Today would be the day that we say, no longer am I going to walk in fear. No longer am I going to walk in this place of pride where, where it's going to be my way. But we're going to walk in this place in dependence upon the Father. Lord, I pray that you reveal to us our unbelief. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. I pray your blessing over every person in this place. In the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. Amen.